Everybody feel it? Yeah. Damn. All right, without further ado, I want to introduce Franny Kelly, Ali Shaheen Muhammad of A Tribe Called Quest, and the man of the hour, DJ Manny Fred. Thank you guys for coming. Thank you so much for coming. <laughs> Good evening. Ladies and gentlemen, cats, dogs, chicks. <laughs> what up, everybody? How y'all doing? A little bit of housekeeping. You've all seen the signs, but you know we're recording. And we will have a Q&A period at the end. Um, so, you know, mind your P's and Q's. Also, if you feel the need to tweet, do that. We wouldn't mind you using our hashtag. Always follow us. We're fun on Twitter, we promise. Shout to Cedric Shine. And I'm going to just kick this off with our traditional intro. I don't know if anybody has heard Met the Microphone Check podcast before. Yeah. All right, so you know how this goes. This is Microphone Check, hip hop from NPR Music. I'm Franny Kelly. I'm Ali Shaheed Muhammad. Elvis Freshly. <laughs> hey, Elvis, I got some Manny questions. Glover. Um, <laughs> who else? Um, wow, that's, this could go on for forever. But most of y'all know me as Manny Fresh. Thank you, thank you, thank, thank you. you. <laughs> so I want to kick this off, if that's okay, by asking you, sir, what is the quintessential... Manny Fresh song. Wow. That's deep. Hmm. You got right into it. <laughs> it hasn't been done yet. Has it been done, but we haven't heard it yet? Or? It, I haven't done it yet. Okay. You know, um, I like a lot of the songs I've done, but I haven't had that moment yet where I just wanted to just back up from the drum machine and be like, damn, that's it. <laughs> so I truly, it had, to me, you know, I haven't done it yet. When have you come the closest? Wow. Mm. The closest. I would say it wasn't a song. It was an album. It was probably Juvenile, 400 Degrees. Yeah. Yeah. It wasn't just one song. It was, it, was, it was probably that album. Okay. And what about that makes it like so you? I mean, it, the thought process of how it came together. Um, it was no pressure. It was just spur of the moment and... You know, and if you listen to some of them songs, like you could probably hear us in the background counting them off, and we didn't really sequence hardly anything on it. We played everything down. Mm -hmm. So I think just the process of how we did it, that was just incredible. And right after that, everything changed to Pro Tools, and you know, just the whole process of, um, you know, we had to um, do those hooks right after each other, you know, it was no flying those hooks, no copying them, pasting them or none of that. It was just the whole raw process of how that album was done. When that, you, that was cool to me. When you say that you uh, didn't sequence it, what can you explain what that means? Um, Basically, like, we, it was pretty much like if it was a old Marvin Gaye Motown session, we pretty much had a count off and we played. Like, you know, we played for however many bars that song was, and Juvie rapped those songs right next to us while we was playing. So we pretty much, you know, like on some of the songs, you can kind of hear where it was probably like 14 bars in his rap instead of 16. So we had to improvise to make the hook, you know, work. So I'm just looking at the bass player going, come on, man, like, you know what we do? <laughs> but it was a great process because we... we literally played those songs from beginning to end. We didn't use no computer generated programs or none of that. So you sculpted this album similarly to like how the Rolling Stones would just everybody be in their little section and be exactly. like one. <laughs> yeah. That's pretty amazing for a hip hop record. Yeah. Especially because at the time you had the tools to sequence everything. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's a couple of songs on it that, that sequence, but even the process of how they was done. Um, and Juvenile album was done with an SP-1200. And, and, and everybody that's not familiar with SP-1200, it was probably like an earlier sampler that was 16-bit, and it had eight outputs on it. And basically what that means is you only had eight sounds. 
so you was limited. So it was just like you do, you, you got to figure out how to do something incredible with eight sounds. So I think that right there made it a great album because it was just like, well, how do we make eight sounds sound incredible? Wow, that's uh, such a classic album. Um, what is the... Do you have a Manny Fresh and album mode sort of process versus Manny Fresh just making beats? Like for 400 Degrees, you say like if, if there's anything that's the quintessential Manny Fresh, it's that album. So is there like an album mode that you go into? Um, I need to listen to some old, old hip hop, some old um, Motown era music first before the artists get there yeah. and blast it and just let it go loud and, you know, let me go crazy for a second and then I'm ready to work. It's just like, that simple. I, yeah, it's that simple. Is, is there like a <laughs> is 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 there like a daily sort of like mantra or just a, a mental state you have to be in? Like you know, okay, we're going in to make Juvie's album, so let me be in this sort of headspace. Or is it just every day is just pretty much spontaneous the, everything? The only thing I would say that probably would kill my mood would be for it to be dark in the room. I, that's that's so, just not me. You, you know, we, we're not killing you. No, right now. This, I'm <laughs> saying if we, if we was working in the studio, and you know, I know a lot of people like this gloomy feeling over yeah. the studio, and I'm like, I'm not getting no energy from that. I don't I'm like, I, I need the lights up, I need lava lamps going on, and all <laughs> kinds of stuff. <laughs> I need a disco ball and all of that. For <laughs> what was uh, Juvie's mood like? I mean, those songs would, would even would, would made it even more incredible. The songs. Juvie already knew him. You know, he, he, 400 Degrees was recorded, the raps at least, a year prior to, you know, us doing that album. When I met him, I, let me go back just a little bit. When I met him, he was getting off of a bus in New Orleans, like, you know, and somebody was like, this kid right here is going to be the next dude, like, in New Orleans. So I was just like, okay, let me hear you rap. So he was just rapping for about two hours, like and all of these songs was phenomenal. And I was just like, dude, I was like, this is incredible. And, it, and what I guess won me over that he knew all of the songs. I was like, wow, you know all your lyrics, like, you know, the hooks, every verse, and you would move on to another song. And, you know, he didn't. So I think what made this, the album even more greater was the fact that he knew the songs. He had perfected them. He, you know, he practiced them. And when we when we got to the studio, it, was, it just came out like, oh, I got this. What were you trying to achieve with that album? Like at that point in his career, what were your was your highest hopes for it? Well, the coolest thing was it wasn't never nothing to achieve. It was just do good music, uh -huh. you know. And I think that's when it comes out the best. When somebody tells me like, um, I'm looking for a hit, and I'm like, I don't really know how to do that. There's no such thing. I just know how to do music. And when you don't have stress and you're just in there and you're doing music and it's coming from the soul or wherever you get it from or whatever, I think that's a great album. You know, and I've got stuff that I've done where I think only me, only me and probably God get it, you know, but it was just something that I felt like it was creative. You know, and I think when we was doing that, we just had this process of we didn't have nobody on our back going, this is what you should do, or this is what the record company want, or whatever. We just was recording whatever, we, you know, whatever we felt. Have you had any, because you have smashes and stacks and stacks of hits and great records. Are there any other records that get you close to the 400 degrees sort of feeling? Um, Man, I still DJ, so... I get a feeling whenever I play records and I see people, um, I guess, go crazy over them, like, go DJ. Mm. Like, you know, when I play that song, like, just to see the crowd go nuts, I'm just like, wow. Like, you know what I'm saying? You just got to look up into heaven and go, God, I'm still relevant, man. <laughs> 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 so, you know, um, it's crazy. I, I can say that about a lot of songs because... It's weird, you know, being a DJ and you have a playlist of your own songs mm. that you can hold it down for an hour. Do you? You know? Are, so he I does guess know. You, I was about to say, well, you, are you... <laughs> you know what I'm... You know. <laughs> are you shy about playing your songs? Or not at all. Uh, <laughs> not at all. Do you ever get on so I'm just not going to play what you want to hear? Well, a lot of times, like, let's just say we have celebrity DJs and I'm, I'm doing that same thing. So that DJ is trying to kill you before yeah. you go on. So I'm like, well, you know what? I'll just play my own music. I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of Go DJ, when you, what did you think when you heard Lollipop? 
I mean, I thought it was a great song because you, you got to look at it like this. Coming from where Wayne came from, we had this thing that we did at Cash Money. The earlier um, Cash Money, first generation, we did a street song and we also did sort of a pop song. Mm -hmm. So it was almost embedded in him to do a song like that and do a street song. Around the same time, the Fireman song was out around the same time with that. So it was just natural that, you know, he would do something like that. I think for my ears, Lollipop sounds like Gold DJ. Yeah. I feel like I feel like I don't I don't remember the producer's name for Lollipop, but I feel like they were channeling. It was it was um Jim Johnson and this guy Darius and around that time that's when I was leaving Cash Money and, and Darius was kind of under me so you know you might hear a few little things oh, yeah, you know here and there he's trying to be a good study <laughs> <laughs> But wasn't that also was that a UNLV song before it was Go DJ Go DJ was a UNLV song back in the but it wasn't the same beat it was oh, just okay. kind of like just this phrase that we always said early on and Wayne liked the song so much that, you know, he decided to turn it into a hook and we did a different beat. But originally that song was recorded maybe seven years before he even thought about doing Go DJ. Right, right, right. And so when you've talked about UNLV in the past, you've you've said that like that essence that they were the essence of hip hop. Yeah. Because they were what you were talking about like in the studio with four hundred degrees that it was just go for it. Do yeah, it. don't to stress about even it. Even explain bounce music. Um, bounce music to me is really is is the beginning of hip hop because it's just call and response. It's just an MC and it's a DJ. It's a break beat and it's you know and it's and it's how can I get the crowd into this? You know how can I get y'all to get up and dance and have a good time? That's the best way I can explain it. So I think the first. The very first generation of Cash Money was it was a bounce label before it was anything, and they had groups like UNLV, um, Pimp Daddy, um, the late Miss T, um, even Magnolia Slim. Like you know, he was signed to Cash Money at one time. Soldier Slim, a lot of people know him as that now. But the the whole thing it was built on party music, and what a lot of people don't know is this song called. Um, drag rap, showboys, and they was from New York. They had this song that was just crazy, and we, as DJs, flipped it over and start backspinning it, just the break 808 part of it, and it took on a whole face of its own in New Orleans, and, and it was like kind of like the birth of bounce music, but it's, uh, the original beat was a beat that came from New York, and these guys never even knew like this was going on down there. It, the, the record was on Profile Records, same label Run DMC was on. And I remember them coming to New Orleans for a concert, and they was doing like all of their other little songs, and the crowd was just looking at them like crazy. <laughs> and then when they sung this song, like they went crazy, and everybody was, they was just like, man, I can't believe. We was just like, yeah, that's the song they've been waiting for. <laughs> like, it was like, this song is crazy now. <laughs> but then also with that, like, you're a big Mantronics fan. Yes, I am. And so, I mean, can you describe how like his music relates to what you make? Do you think of it as a continuation? Oh yeah, definitely. Cause I, I mean, if you if you ever listen to Mantronics, you can hear you can hear that in Manny Fresh all day long. Mm -hmm. Like you know, um, his snare rolls, the triplets. Um, he was the first one who was tuning eight oh eight drums. Um, the edits that he was doing in songs or whatever, and all of that. I'm, I was a huge Man Mantronics fan. I think. He was way ahead of his time with the way he was programming on um, drums and all of that. Like it's it's just amazing. Um, even the, the bass lines he was putting in songs, some of the R and B songs that he had, and everything. Like as a producer, and I took on this thing that man, Trinus can do albums. I can do albums. Like you know, whenever um you had T. L. Rock who was um under Mantronics. Um, of course, his group or whatever, this girl, Joyce Sims, like she had some cool R&B songs or whatever. And all of those songs was jamming, jamming songs. And it came from one guy. And you knew his production when you heard it. So I was just like, I got to have something that's signature about Manny Fresh, you know, when you hear it. Did you ever get to meet him? No. I have something that's crazy that's coming up in New Orleans, um, I want to say probably in the next two or three months, that... Um, 
if I could say this, Red Bull is putting it on for me, and they um they're gonna find all of these people that was inspirations to me. Um, they already got Trouble Funk, so they bringing them down to New Orleans <laughs> for me. <laughs> and Mantronics, you know what I'm saying? So that's that's gonna be pretty cool. I get to meet my idols, people who I look up to. I hope that's on video. Yeah, okay, it will good. be. Okay, good. <laughs> As a DJ, what what do you? feel about the climate of hip hop right now. Um, Whew, that's a tough one. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Um, I can honestly say this. I think I keep hearing the same song over and over again. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to keep it real with you. You know, it's my job to play as a DJ, you know, but I keep hearing the same song over and over again. Um, I know everybody said this or whatever, but it's, it's the truth. So it don't matter how many times we say it. I think in my era, we had Public Enemy, who we considered pro-black. You had Slick Rick, who was the storyteller. You had, um, you know, Cash Money, who was with whatever the blinged out rappers or whatever. You had N.W.A., who was the gangster raps. So that's a bunch of genres of rap right there. We don't have that no more. We just got a whole bunch of wannabes. Like, you know what I'm saying? We don't have nobody who, you know, like, wow, man, stick your neck out there. Do something different. And everything that I just named a second ago, it gave you a choice. So if you didn't like something, you like, well, I can stick with what I like. Now everything sounds the same. So when you're, when you're DJing, what do you, do you kind of just take over and say, I'm just going to completely do me, stretch out, play something else? Or do you kind of, like, feed the state of where we are right now. What I've learned, um, my introduction to this was the whole production thing was remixes. So when I want you to understand something, I remix it. So I think that's how I'm winning now. So it's kind of like if, if it's a cool song that I think that was an old song or whatever, that's I'm like, hey, I'll put some trap drums behind it. If it's Earth, Wind & Fire and you're not getting it, I'm going to make you get it. <laughs> Can can I get a couple of those Manny Fresh? <laughs> I got you. <laughs> Earth, Wind & Fire special remix. <laughs> that would be so well. Well, how do you feel about like when people sample you or take your song? Like, what about practice that Drake it, song? It doesn't really bother me. Like, you know, because I think I came up in that era of hip hop. I did the same thing. You know, I was a Dr. Dre fan. I was a Mantronics fan. So I kind of got my ideas off of their songs or whatever, and that was my practice period. I just think um, I get it. People got to get paid or whatever and all of that, but we still kind of took away from the essence of hip-hop by saying, well, man, if you just take a phrase from me, I want my money. I don't think, like, you know, it's not that serious. It was, it was, it's a craft, like, you know, and it was who could make something great with, you know, with what you got to work with. Now we worry about if you just take a snare from somebody, they going, well, that's my snare. And I'm like, you can't, that's not your snare. <laughs> <laughs> you know that there's a precedent case about a snare drum, it was um, too short. I don't wow. remember which song, but um, he sampled um, the uh, Impeach the President drums. Yeah. And it, from that snare drum, some judge just decided, well, this snare drum signifies this actual drum sound and drum pattern from this song. So this is one little snare drum, it cost you just to... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the dollars and go up. It's just that crazy. And... I think technology, technology has probably killed a lot of things because now is is you could just go crazy. You know, if you if you got a program where you just like I got an endless amount of tracks, you know what I'm saying? So your mind you, you don't have to think that deep no more. Whereas like if I told you, hey, you just got eight sounds, do something incredible, mm -hmm. you know, you that's that's like wow, I'm about to kill myself. Just eight sounds. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I think technology, you know, I know everything has to evolve, but it's not making a lot of people think. When you go in, speaking of technology, what are you using to to record off of now? I found that the songs that even right now that I'm working on, I had to go backwards. I've tried some new things and I got some dope songs on technology, but I had to go back to my MPC. I had to go back to my SP 1200 to get the sounds that I want to get my drums to sound how I want them to sound. So 
I think with technology is more of me trying to keep up. But in the studio, the last few songs that I've recorded, I went back to what made Manny Fresh, Manny Fresh. That's dope. What do you think of some of the um, sound plugins, like the recreation of the 808 drums, considering 808 is like the yeah. backbone, the base of a lot of the Southern hip hop? Um, what do you think of some of the plugins? Do you mess around with some? Yeah, of the I think ones? I think that's cool. Is is when I guess this is the thing when you have something that do it for you. There's nothing wrong with saying, okay, I could get an app or a plugin that's an 808 plugin. But when I buy something and, and it can, I guess, imitate and emulate the beat, I'm like, I'm not, I'm not really working. You, you know, you have things now that you could buy that it had, it's, it's pretty much, it's got chords in it already. Mm -hmm. It's got piano patterns in it already. And it's just like, well, why do I have to work? I mean, you know, that's why we have to define things between beat makers and producers. Because, you know, you could buy a program right now that's called Beat Maker and the beats are already there. Mm. And you're like, I'm just going to twerk a little something and do a few little things and I'm going to pass this on as mine. Yeah. You know, so I think there's nothing wrong with embracing technology and even getting drums or getting sounds from it is when you're not really creating nothing. But, you know, you, you have it in your mind like this is an art. It's not really an art. It's just somebody jacking something that's already there. What do you say to those kids who think that that's the world of creating? Like, it's it's as simple as dragging a few audio files or MIDI files and moving a couple of notes and thinking that that's making music. Well, I mean, man, we could stay on that subject for a long time. I just think when it comes to music, a lot of kids think that is the, before we even get to that, First of all, a lot of kids think it's the get rich quick scheme. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's not a lot of people that's willing to put in work, hard work, and develop a sound or create something that's originally theirs or whatever, you know, before going, well, I could just click on something, I could drag something, and I'm done. And I'm all, and you know, and I'm there. And, and a lot of it is I'm imitating what I see because. If right now your favorite rapper, he does an interview and he says like, well, you know, I really didn't want to do this. I just put this song out and mm -hmm. now y'all love me, you know, and it's just like, damn, it's that simple, you know, and real talk, everybody's scared to say this. We need more doctors. We need more, a whole bunch of other things. We don't need a whole bunch of rappers and producers. <laughs> it's crowded. Like, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> But part of that also, I mean, when you're making 400 Degrees, you're making it with a group of people, right? Mm -hmm. That happens less frequently these days. Yeah. Funny story. Funny, funny story. Um, I was in Atlanta, and I was working with an artist, and the guy who's always played guitars on all of my songs from 400 Degrees to whatever. So the guy's like, I want a trap beat. And I'm like, okay, cool. So I was like, well, I just kind of wanted to move a little bit more. So I called in my bass player, and... You know, he's playing on a song, and a kid stood up, and he was like, man, whatever that thing is right there, he's like, whatever that thing is, what he doing, I was like, the guitar? <laughs> <laughs> and he was like, yeah, that thing. And I was like, you never saw a guitar. <laughs> I was like, this is amazing. I was like, wow, you never saw a guitar. He was like, I heard of one, but I never seen one. <laughs> So how can we get people, how do you incentivize people to work together in a room? I mean, it's got to be love for it first, you know, yeah. because now you got to think about it. When you get five people in the room, it's, it's um, four of them haven't done nothing, but they all got managers. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> You're like, well, dang, this, this is an opportunity. Like, let's start with that first before we have to sit down and we got to talk with your manager or whatever, and we ain't done nothing yet. We haven't created nothing. We, didn't, we haven't sold nothing yet, so you ain't got nothing to lose. It's like, let's just let's create something first. But right now, it's just like I'm saying, it's based on popularity. And if it's not that, it's just everybody taking pictures before we even work. You know what I'm saying? It's like, dude, stop posting everything. Like, can we get started? <laughs> Do you find that people who come to you, who know all the work that you've put in. How many albums have you recorded so far? Man, I have no idea. It's, <laughs> it's your, your catalog is, so it's kind of like, you haven't touched Duke Ellington yet, man, but you, from the hip hop perspective, as one soul producer is very close to that. Yeah. Um, 
Duke Ellington has stacks of albums. You have stacks of albums. Do people come to you with that sort of shortcut mentality with you? Thinking? Yeah, all the time. You know, um, I get a lot of time where somebody will say, I want to hire you, but I want to tell you what to do. I'm like, well, why do you want me to do it if you're going to tell me what to do? I could just sit back and let you do it. You know, or is I know everything. I've had sessions where I got hired just for somebody to take a picture of my equipment. You know, and I'm just like, and the next time, you know, I see them, they got everything I, I had. Mm. <laughs> and I'm like, so that's what this was about? You, I mean, you can't do what I do. You can take a picture of it. <laughs> well, I'm like, okay, you're going to copy all of everything that I use or whatever. And, you know, and a lot of times the shortcut is this. You meet people and they're very humble when you first meet them. You know what I'm saying? And after that hit song happens, oh, my God, the next time it's entourage and all kind of craziness going on. And they telling you, like, hey, man, this is not how you do the song. This is how I'm going to do the song. <laughs> Don't you just love that position? <laughs> Who has challenged you most in a positive way? Wow. Mm. In a positive way. I would probably say Wayne when we was doing the first Carter. Mm. It, was, it was critical. Ten years ago yeah. this year. It was critical for Cash Money, too, because, you know, they was in a place where it was, you know, it was like, we need a hit album. Like, you know, and it was when we was doing the first Carter, he decided that he wasn't going to write raps, you know, no more on paper. He was just going to go from his soul and everything. Mm -hmm. So it would it would be times where he would come to the studio and he would say things like, you know, even when it was it was critical to his mom, when he would be like, man, my mama don't like that. Like, shit, like, we got to change this. My mama don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> like, could you, what, just an element that his mom would find, like, not. The, um, let me tell you, we was doing something, and it's this song on his album called Earthquake, but it's Al Green. It's an Al Green sample, and we just played it over. So we was trying to find something that would bring young and older people together. Mm. And the first song, I think, we started out with, it was um it was probably we was just going through some break beats like some old break beat songs or whatever and i found something that had like some cool chords and his mom came in the studio and she threw the headphones down and she was just like that's not it <laughs> that's not it i don't know what's going to happen but that's not it so following her he did the same thing he was just like listen something got to happen something got to you know what i'm saying so i was like you know what let me let me try something. So when I did the Al Green song and I played it over, you know, she came in there snapping her fingers and she was like, okay, now you on to something. <laughs> <laughs> did that album take a bit longer than maybe some of your others? Yeah, of it dynamic? did. You know, plus we was recording, we was on the road sometimes and we was recording all over the place. And even Go DJ, like I said, he dug that up from just out of popularity. You know, he was just like, man, I need something that... That's gonna make me that hometown hero. He was oh. just like, you know, he knew that Go DJ was one of the popular songs back in the yeah. G, back in the G in New Orleans that I did. And he was like, man, I need this right here. And he was like, I don't know how you gonna change the beat. What, what you gonna do? But I need this. How old was he at that point? <sighs> man, I, I really don't know. Fairly young, super, still super young, and extremely focused yeah. on this record. Mm -hmm. To name it, the Carter. Did he give you the concept behind it? Yeah. You know, he, he, had, he had already had it in his mind that he was like, this is going to be my legacy. He was like, from now on, this is going to be the name of all my albums. He was like, this is the new Wayne. This is what's different about me. You know, he was like, I know, you know, my earlier cash money stuff was, you know, people thought it was just gimmicky that I didn't curse and, you know, and I had nice wordplay or whatever. But he was like, I got to establish myself as a rapper. So it was just like, I know what I'm doing. He was like, so from here on out, everything is going to be a Carter. Did you challenge him equally? Oh, yeah. And we changed way? the songs over and over. You know, if I felt like his raps was better than the beat that I did, you know, I would let him go home and tomorrow it would be a different beat. You know, but I've always been that person. You know, I'm, I'm competitive. If, if, if you're very competitive, then it's going to bring the best out in me. I, I just don't meet that no more. You know, you get people that's, okay, that's all I'm going to give you, and I'm gone. And I'm like, dude. And if you comment, you know, right right now, 
it's like you'll get stoned if you tell somebody they was drunk. Like, I was like, dude, you was drunk when you did them lyrics. You're all over the place. It's just like, man, that's how I wanted it to be. You just <laughs> like, nah, dude, you could do that better. And it's just like, stone him. <laughs> so you guys are in the studio again, yeah? Yeah. We're actually working on Carter Five right now. Is it the same type of dynamic? From what I've done, yeah, you know, we he's like, dude, I want that essence. I want that Manny Fresh. And the songs that we've done, it's musicians. Same concept of what we was talking about. You know, it's five guys in there, and we counting off songs, playing. Do you ever, is, is it part of the process where you play him and mostly finish beat, and he sort of reacts? and? Well, it's, it's really, a lot of times, he knows how I work, and you know, and anybody that, that worked with me for a long time, I kind of want the the um, MC, rapper, whatever they call himself right now, to be in the building with me when I'm doing it. Okay. So we can feed off each other. I'm like, hey, let me hear what you're saying. So if I hear what you're saying, I know exactly how to design that beat for you. And if we're not getting that, it's like, hey, let's go out, let's go have some drinks, let's talk about what's going on in life, now let's go back to the studio. Okay. I'm also thinking of there's a video of you that's just you and Mystical in a car yeah. in New Orleans. <laughs> it's been viewed over a million times. It's like a six minute long video and you're just playing him beats. He, he had never heard those before? No, he's never heard them. What does it time. feel like when somebody reacts to something you made like that? He's bugging out. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess it's, it's, I look at it like this is what I do. Like, you know, I really feel like even though if I haven't put out a song in six or seven years, I got to do at least two or three songs a day because I'm going to feel like I fell off. Mm -hmm. So I, it's, it's really, I won't say it makes me feel a certain way or whatever because like right now I could play you over 200 songs, you know, because that's what I do. I do them all the time. And that's I'm still in love with doing it. So And on top of that, I like to be ready when somebody call me. If you call me and you like, hey, I'm like, well, I'm about to wear your ass out. Are you ready? Let's go. <laughs> um, do you want to, is now the time when you want to talk about most stuff and talk about the process yeah. of making a song with him? Most is incredibly talented. You know what I'm saying? Talented. And... He's very animated. Like, he's one of the most craziest dudes in the world. So our, our process is this. I'm going to tell you all, really. We got to listen to him talk for two or three hours about life. <laughs> <laughs> we got to let him get it all out. Like, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> he got to give us all his conspiracy theories and all of that and all of this. And then we like, okay, dude, you good? Everything? <laughs> you ready? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? He's like, okay, I'm ready. Like, all right, you sure you don't have nothing else to get out? <laughs> and, you know, and, and it, it's crazy. And from, it's weird because where he's from, his knowledge of hip-hop is nuts to me. Southern hip-hop, the culture and all of that. Like, you know what I'm saying? He'll be in the middle of rap and stop and be like, dude, what you think about Rick Ross? Huh? <laughs> <laughs> And I'm like, we like Rick Ross. And he's just like, I just, I just wanted to know what y'all think. All right, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's weird, like, you know, his process, but I get it, you know. And we was going to studios at first when we was doing it, and I, and I found out early on that the studio is not the place to record him. It's got to be somewhere where it's comfortable, like, you know, and we're finishing the album at my house because it's like we got to give him that space to you know, talk, do whatever it is that he do. He got to take a long walk every now and then, come back, and he's ready to record. But everything is coming out great. Okay. Do you want to talk about th this one song in particular? Yeah. Um, we just finished the song that, you know, everybody's been asking, when is this coming out or whatever. So I just finished one of the songs the other day or whatever, and it's called Let's Go, you know, and I'll play it for y'all. And, you know... <laughs> <laughs> And since you were saying challenging, oh, he's very, you know what I'm saying? He's like, dude, like, I know, I know this Southern thing that you do, but I know, I kind of like, I want my drums to be straight. And I'm like, dude, listen, I got this. <laughs> All you need to do is just rap. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he does that really well. No, yeah. I'm not. I mean, I'm serious. Like, he amazes me because 
his process of writing and, and memorizing things, I, I guess it's him being an actor, it helps, but he's the first artist that I've ever seen just kind of like sit there like this and then go in and spit it without writing it. And I heard about Jay-Z doing it, but this was before hearing about Jay-Z doing it. So most is that, that dude. And I got to say this, what I do love and admire about him is his cockiness. Like, you know, <laughs> I, I love people that, you know, feel like nobody can't touch me. Like, you know, and he's, he's quick to say that. You know, he'll be like, yeah, you can turn that off. They can't touch me. <laughs> cool. Uh, you want to play the song now or what? Yeah, why not? Why, why not? not? Why not? I want to say a big thank you to Bobby Carter, DJ Cousin B. Y'all heard him? Ladies and gentlemen, a classic. A classic. This love. It's been a long Long time coming, but I know a change gon' come. Yeah, I chose the path, the path chose me. It's the Lord's plan, divine decree. Natural high, window sheet, up a parallel view, let the ghetto see. BK, and OLA, OMF, chill deep, amazing grace. Hater whispers, blah, blah, blah. You too serious to nothing, hearty heart. But it's no joke, with a winning smile and one voice with many styles. Been fresh, get fresh, she can crush it now. Strong bone, I flow, watch it pull a plow. I'm going in, they out of luck. And now, sucker, it's now another hit one on one. Custom fit, December slim. Block go to first, baby, I'm him. This swag authentic, it's not a gimmick. Who went dumb and stayed dumb? Lord forgive him. I don't mind the cynics. I'm on my business, stay away above the game, the end's clever. Let's go, let's go, let's get it. Let's go, let it go now. Nah. Let it go, let's get it. Get it, get it, bottom, bottom. Let's go, let's go, let's get it. Let's go, let it go now. Nah. Let it go, let's get it. Super mathematics, not a problem, no lock for that old block. So sign away for that bull rock. Super small, handcrafted, all this size, no, they know not. Flow tougher than tough town. Blacker than the gram, they drum line. No overdose, I'm over. Woke up, be away from crunch time. Be yeah, everywhere like sunshine. I leave right cross, punchline. I beat the track, I eat the track, brown paper breakfast. Lunchtime, dinner date, dessert tray. Wrong with all, flow hungry, you see the sign between the line. It's G's only. No dummies, I flow lovely, they go nutty. They catch a feeling, these hoes touchy. I tell that jump off, no bunch, no awakening. Home study, but you're so pretty. Bless your show, sometimes the best way to touch it. Stand up, get it. Let's go, let's go, let's get it. Let's go, let it go now. Let it go, let's get it. Get it, get it, got them, got them. Let's go, let's go, let's get it. Let's go, let it go now. Before I chose the path, the path chose me. This is a large plan, divine decree. Your captain speaking, pilot seat. BK at no LA, OMF, GOD. Hard to get him to rap like that. <laughs> That's dope. So wait, what do you mean it's hard to get him to rap like? I that? mean, you know, because that. I was like, dude, I'm gonna switch the beat, and he was just like, don't do that. And I was like, listen, I got this. I know what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> what is that song? What's it called? Let's go. Let's go. Mm -hmm. What did he say? Sometimes the best time to touch to something is to let it go. Yeah. What does that song do for you in terms of? 
I think your, your beginning, your origin, where you began making music, and to where you are right to now. To me, is a um a super collabo. Like it, it is is what hip hop needs, really. Like you know what I'm saying. That's a breath of fresh air because we two different people from two different eras, two different sounds, all of that. You know, and right now hip hop is scared to do that. Yeah. You know, and to have uh to me a true MC. Rap over a Manny Fresh beat, like you know what I'm saying. I'm like, wow, that's incredible. It is incredible. You know, so I think like even what we're doing, a lot of it is is pushing the envelope. It's just like wow, like I'm like, we got to do something that you know the world is not really ready for, but they want to hear it. They want to hear it again. It's it's from my ears, and you all have. I'm pretty sure your own opinion and Franny, but for me, it just brings most into the. Uh, conversation of now in hip hop, and I think that he has a tendency to be such a hip hop purist. Yeah, and it for his fans so that know him, that accept that they go for that, and that's great. But in terms of like being in the conversation outside of your comfort level, your comfort zone, the normal kind of dialogue that you have and and reception that you have with your fans, this brings him in in a very tasteful in a real kind of a way. You mean he's going to be on the radio again? He's going to, exactly. <laughs> yeah. And the reason why I ask you, you know, what does this song do for you? Because, you know, my my relationship with your music, it comes from the trap. You know, it comes from yeah. oppression. It comes from having to sell drugs. It comes from having to hustle or do things to feed your family. You know, so to 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 know that that's the the, the bulk of your work has that sort of a statement on it and to have something that's a completely different viewpoint at this time and age 2014 it's almost like 20 years to you stepping into the yeah. music industry so that's why i was asking like for that's you. exactly what i mean is it's a breath of fresh air it's like you know pressing the reset button to say like hey how do we um i guess get the world back interested in what we thought hip hop was mm -hmm. you know when i first started out i gave you you know four different things. We had gangster rap, we had, you know, like I said, Slick Rick, the storyteller, whatever, and all of that. But the one thing was about all of those songs, it was jamming beats. Yeah. You know, we never really put a stamp on beats, but now we do because we like, okay, because Manny Fresh is used so often, you know, it's just like, well, now to me, I'm like, God, come on, like the trap, <laughs> you know, we, we, we've been killing the trap beats. Yeah. But I mean, when you say you changed the beat for him, you basically made it a danceable song, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. How does that, like, how do you know that that's going to work? I mean, is you there don't. a formula? Okay. You really don't. You know what I'm saying? You just take a chance and you do good music. Mm -hmm. And I think some of the songs we doing are traditional hip hop songs. Yeah. But mm -hmm. my, my job is to make sure they're jamming traditional hip hop songs, mm -hmm. where it's not something where you just like, man, I don't get that. Like, you know, where you're just trying to figure out, like, man, that snare is like, I don't know. Like, <laughs> so my, my job with, 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 you know, working with most is to say, I'm going to push my envelope, too, to do something different. But I want it to also be something that everybody can get. Well done. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> is there anybody that you've, like, always wanted to work with? Man, I think all of them dead. I would like to hear that. <laughs> Marvin Gaye, you know? <laughs> I, I think people who I really like, Nina Simone, like, you know what I'm saying? So, um, Bob Marley, like, you know, I'm inspired by just listening to that music. It makes me want to do music. And it's something about the, the artists that I just named, their music timeless. Like, you know, before you was born, you, you know, you didn't even know these albums existed. When somebody turned you on to it, you instantly like it. And I don't think we have nothing like that right now. So I, I know that's crazy to say, but most of the people who I really, really like, or if I could probably have my way, it would be a bunch of old school hip hop dudes. I would probably go like Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five, Houdini, the cats who I grew up on. Like, you know, I would definitely work with them for nothing because I just love hip hop. Would you ever like remix a Nina Simone record yeah. or have you done that before? Yeah, I, I, I have, like, you know, and a lot of times it's just like I said, that's stuff that's in my own little world 
where you know I might play it. I might play it for my closest friends because they like, dude, why did you torque Nina <laughs> Nina Simone? <out?" laughs> and I'm like, well, I like I like it like that. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> So it's you know it's it's I you know I have my my moments when I, I remember and it's a crazy story too and I'll tell y'all um the guy who was the drummer for Guns N' Roses um and Primus he gave me some some files and he was just like when you get home check this out I was working on a video game with them and it was like when you get home check out these files so I was like okay cool he was like you're gonna love this so when I got home. It was the sessions for like Bob Marley Legend album, and it was the studio sessions, and it was the sessions for some Marvin Gaye songs. So we was just clowning around with Marvin Gaye songs in the studio, and my friend decided to put it in auto tune, like you know what I'm saying? Oh, <laughs> and we was man. just like, dude, don't do that, Marvin, turn it over. His he was like, but we could put a bounce beat behind it. And okay. I was like, nah, dude, don't do that. Like, we're just, I'm like, okay, let's, like, we could do it, but I'm like, it's going to stay right here in the studio. What do you, so are you saying that there's nothing from, like, even the R&B side of the world that's inspiring right now, like new music? Man, that's deep. Wow. Nope. <laughs> So what do we have to do to fix that, too? Man? <laughs> we, we're going to fix a whole just, lot of things I, today. I, I just miss singing, dude. And what mm -hmm. I mean is I don't want nothing to correct you. I just want to hear you sing. Like, you know what I'm saying? And, I mean, like Jodeci. Jodeci, you know, they did all of their vocals and they were stacked and everything was incredibly cool or whatever and all of that. And you had nothing that corrected them. Like, you just knew that they could sing. <laughs> they did their background vocals, they did the main vocals, they did all of that. Now it's just like, well, damn, it's you and six people who make up you. <laughs> so basically, if you need auto-tuning, then you need to just no, like, not, check your I, I code think, at the door. I mean, I'm just saying. I'm I think auto-tuning is not a bad thing. It's not really. Yeah. But when have you heard somebody that can genuinely sing? Like, you know what I'm saying? Well, you just like... I'm impressed with that. Yeah. Like, you know, now it's like almost any of us, like, you know, if you stay in your, your lane, you good. Like, if somebody say, well, go ahead and say something, you're like, well, as long as you stay right there on that note, you good. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's really nobody to me that really can sing. Like, like where I'm like, wow, like, that's, that's incredibly cool. Like, you wrote all of these songs and you did your backgrounds and you did all of that. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, when you do a session, it's 20 people, and, and, and most of them are writers and all of that, and the artist is just something that's a face. It's a look. Like, it's like, well, you know, and I'm not ratting on anybody or nothing, but it's just like, wow, back in, in a G, it was more of that was part of your personality, like your songs. Your songs were, were you, whatever you was going through. So what inspires you? What keeps you still motivated to keep making music? Like, because the, the, the most Def track is hot, you know, it's dope. It's, it has the energy that I think is needed, you know, for blending both worlds. So what do you, what motivates you to get to that point? Um, I'm whenever, like I DJ parties, man, the crazy thing is, I think that's, that's a turn on for me more than having a hit record. Like, you know, when I'm like the guy that you control the party, like you actually got all of these people dancing, you, you know, for whatever you play or whatever, whatever you drop, you have their attention right then and there. So that's what motivates me. I mean, even my production to a certain degree, it comes from a DJ. You know, it's a DJ thing. Like, you know, I wanna, I always wanna see people having a good time. So I think that's where the motivation comes from. It's just seeing the energy that people, if, if it's, it's like one nation under a groove. That's, that's the best way to describe it, how that's said. Yeah. Like, you know, if you got everybody and they not tripping on nothing else that's going on in the world for that moment and you have their attention and you are the guy that's controlling that. That's a great thing. Yeah, it is. But if you don't have the proper material to really like make it passionate, you know, and I say that also as a DJ, because even watching like the wave pattern, since we're using programs like Serato to DJ, you can look at the waves and just the color and the, the look of the wave, the algorithm on music from uh, yeah. the 90s era looks different, you know, than the waves of the music right now. And you see that energy. I see the energy in the screen. I see the energy from the people. Like, there's a shift if you're playing, like, um, Protect Your Neck from Wu-Tang Clan versus... Go ahead, say it. 
I can't even put anything out there. That's how this, like, I'm Something just called dis- shorty. So. <laughs> <laughs> but <of> so. <laughs> you know, there's a there's a definite shift in the movement of the room, and you know, people will come up to me if if you play and protect your neck. A lot of people won't necessarily disrespect Wu Tang, but a couple of jams I'm in that era, that moment, and people say, "Could you play something I could dance to?" And I'm just like, "What do you mean?" <laughs> no request. <laughs> yeah, no request. So I'm just, you know, asking you, you know, what, what, being in that p- position as a DJ is the sole controller. Like, what's a Manny Fresh? DJ set. Well, I really don't have a set. Like you know, I kind of I feed off people energy. Yeah. And I've I, I've always been that that guy that's like I don't have a set of records that I play. Like I'm more of like whatever is going on. And you know, I could go from a trap song to disco in a heartbeat. Like you know what I'm saying? Because I'm really on the energy of let's have a good time. Yeah. You know, and I'm on introducing you to something that you you haven't been introduced to, but. I'm going to do it in such a cool way that it's like, damn, like, I can't get off the floor right now. Like, damn, that was so smooth the way he brought that in. Like, so I think it's, it's, it's sometimes your skills, too, as a DJ. And just know this, from your era, the great thing is this. I, I know I'm, I'm, I'm that person, too. Like, sometimes I hate technology. Sometimes I love it. But what I do love about my era is if you gave me two 1200s without Serratos, I still can bust your ass, like, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, you know, but if I got to use that, I'll use that. So that's the great thing about coming up in our era. So it's like, yeah, I can embrace, the, b- embrace this, but can you go backwards? Mm. So you got a lot of cats who can't go backwards. It's nothing, you know, I get it because a lot of times if I'm booked on a festival, you can't really use a turntable because the wind is blowing and all kind mm-hmm. of stuff is going mm-hmm. on. So now you, you just stepped into the controller. So you got to mm. kind of embrace everything. But it, it's, it's, to me, a lot of it is your, your passion for music, too. Because if you've been doing this for a while and you know people, you kind of can look out in the crowd and you know what's going on. If you got a set playlist, then you kind of, to me, a make-believe DJ. Because you can't, you can't say this is what I'm going to play. You know, because you really don't know what you're going to play. What if the DJ before you played everything that you thought you was going to play? Now you, now you have no, you, you sitting there going, man, I can't believe he played all of the songs. <laughs> like, <laughs> but is, and it's different where you go. Like, is the D.C. Yeah. set different from New Orleans, different from the Bay? Is a festival set I don't set think, no, it's good club? music. Good music will always win. Yeah. Good music will always win. There's nothing like good music. If you play a good song, it's like, you know how we have some old school DJs that don't even mix. They just play good records. Mm-hmm. And you have this kid that came on and he did juggling and da 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 and all of this da da da. And this old cat came and he played like Frankie Beverly and May. <laughs> he just raised his hand up in the crowd. Went, ah, ah. <laughs> he just played good music, you yeah. know what I'm saying? <laughs> Speaking of, I mean, to be kind of like corny for a moment, good music. You did, you worked with Kanye yeah. on the Watch the Throne. Uh, there's a trend right now to have like a whole bunch of producers kind of get together to do like maybe one song. Mm-hmm. When you did the song, the one was that your song? No, it was actually Marsha's song, and it was weird because I think more of anything, it was a bunch of young cats that just wanted to kind of see how I program drums. That's how it really came. <laughs> what? Like you know, it was a bunch of people just standing around me going, "Well, let's see him do this." <laughs> like you know, what I'm saying I've heard the stories. Can he do this in five minutes? Like, you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And, you know, I, that's what I was left with. Like, I'm like, okay, play the song for me. And, you know, and I did the drums on the MPC and did all the breaks and all of that. And everybody was like, oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> you, like, got, you, know, you, you, you got to understand, you got your way around the drum machine. <laughs> yeah, so it was just like, and, and I, you know, just not knowing them, I never, I didn't think, you know, none of these kids never been on a drum machine before. You know, I'm like, oh, so y'all do this with a computer. I get it. Mm-hmm. Like, you know what I'm saying? So I, so it was more of everybody going, well, we just really want to see how the MPC operate. Mm-hmm. And, and it was like somebody going, well, I heard you do your breaks on the fly. You know what I'm saying? And I'm like, yeah, I'll just kind of tap them out or whatever. So you got, you know, so that's, that's really how that song kind of came out. We did a whole bunch of songs before that, but mm-hmm. that particular song, it was more of, like, like what you said, it was a bunch of younger producers that was hanging around mm-hmm. that was just like, okay, it's Manny Fresh Day. We just want to see like how 
you know, how he programmed this. And Marshall was just like, we keeping that song. I don't care what y'all say, we keeping that song. <laughs> mm. Do you have any other up and coming sort of like um, apprentice in, a, in the wings that's just under you watching you or that you're grooming? I got um, some young dudes, flight school, that's from New Orleans, a bunch of young producers. And, you know, from engineers to producers, that's pretty much the only outside group that I work with other than the um, musicians that I've always worked with my whole career. Mm -hmm. Like, I got two guitar players that I've been using my whole career, and, you know, we still get down and do what we do. Um, Man, we got to wrap it up. We do? I'm so sad. Not wrap it up, wrap it up, but, like, yeah, bring y'all into the, the conversation. I just, uh, okay, just so before I do that, um, <laughs> interpolations. Mm -hmm. When you interpolate a song, like, for example, um, can you no. define interpolation? Real interpolation quick? is, um, you know what? Can you play the Gilligan's Island song for me, real quick? <laughs> Interpolations. Sounds like a hot relationship. <laughs> <laughs> we involved in interpolations. <laughs> <laughs> I did not have interpolations with that. <laughs> that record, Whitney Houston. What what does that remind you of, by the way? I mean, of course, I've always said somebody was like, "Still fly," right. came from that. The cool thing was they never came looking for me because <laughs> I was smart enough to change some notes to be like, "Nah, that's not your song." We never went. All the way there. <laughs> like, I stayed right there. <laughs> like, you know what I'm saying? So everybody thought, like, still, still Fly, you know, came from that. True enough, real talk, I wasn't even thinking of that song when I did it. But, I mean, it could have been subliminal or whatever, but I was not thinking of that song when I did it. And I even Universal was trying to clear it. And I was like, no, don't do it. Like, I'm like, I, I, you know, because I heard the song, when I, and I was like, yeah, it is that melody, but I'm like, the notes are not that. So, uh, luckily, like I said, nobody never came Gilligan or the Skipper or none of them came looking for <laughs> um, Another song that, I don't know if this was an interpolation, you have to tell me. Okay. Uh, Funkadelic, I'll Stay. <laughs> no. No? Uh -uh. I just grew up on, you know what I'm saying, those songs. You know, um, the crazy thing is, Bling Bling came from is this Johnson Crew song called Space is the Place. Mm -hmm. And the song go bum, 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 bum. You know, and I was just like, I always liked that song. Like, you know what I'm saying? So I just changed the notes to, you know what I'm saying? So a lot of the stuff is more of just me growing up in that era, listening to those, those songs. I mean, I got Hot Boy songs that sound like Rush, Tom Sawyer. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, and somebody's like, well, damn, you, why would the black dude be listening to Tom Sawyer? <laughs> 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 I, I actually, I actually, I actually would like to hear those because I'm into some Tom yeah. Sawyer. But so, you have a way with interpolations. Interpolating, I guess I, I don't know if I did define what interpolating is. I'm sorry, Frank. Yeah. Um, it's just taking a song like the Gilligan's Island song and uh, doing your version of the song, and you will change a couple of notes. Like Vanilla Ice tried to do it with Ice Ice Baby, and he didn't succeed. And it's I don't, I don't, there, there's rules to it, but sometimes the rules change on you, and it really depends on if the artist really can yeah. sing it out, and you can clearly paint out that, no, this is, this is clearly different. Um, we, the most recent case of that is the um, Robin Thicke. Yeah. Uh, oh, with the Marvin yeah. Well, yeah, you know, so with Blurred Lines, and that, confuse some people and some people is pretty obvious and clear. Um, so that's interpolating is just taking someone's song or what they say you did, you took my song and you changed it, but it's still my song. And it's like, no, I had a dream and these notes came together. Yeah, I certain, honestly think certain way and if you grew up in an era and you listen to, you know, Michael Jackson a whole lot. 
some of your songs are going to sound like Michael Jackson. Yeah. You're going to have some of them grooves, some of them, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. You might want to put a hee-hee in it every now and then, <laughs> a, you know, but you're just like, wow, like, that's just, you know, now, if it's bluntly his song, you know, like, yeah, but I just think... I, I I heard so much music to it was just nuts. Like, you know, you could take back that thing up, for instance. Um, it was like, how can we make this song successful? Like, how can we make it pop and how can we make it hood? And I was like, it's classical music. We're going to put some classical music on top. We're going to go Johann Sebastian Bach, you know what I'm saying? I'm like, I'm going to go in. <laughs> like, behind this 808 beat, I'm telling you, I got this. And they just like... Classical music. So when you're telling some hood dudes that, they're like, what's, what's classical music? <laughs> I'm like, I got it. Don't worry about it. The strings and the 808. And yeah. that's what that, the made that that hit. That's astonishing. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. You're very welcome. We want to take some questions, too. So the way we're going to work this is there's this center mic. And if anybody has a question for Manny, if you could line up over there, go crazy. <laughs> and if you could introduce yourself, that would, that would be really nice. How you doing? Uh, my name is Cheyenne. I'd like to first just say Checkmate was my favorite cash money album you ever did with BG. My question is, can you tell us how you and Wayne did BMJR on the Carter One? That's like the best track ever. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's kind of like what I was explaining to them. The whole process was um, we kind of had a whole bunch of talented people just, you know, around. And I think a lot of my music, a lot of people don't get credit for, you know, um, for what they do. And I've always tried to put like my keyboard players or if I had somebody that did percussion or whatever on the album because I know that means the world to them and what I mean put their name on it like give them their credit for what they you know and I've always had talented people around me that sometimes when I was dragging you know and I, I was kind of slacking like you know they picked it up so I think to I, I could say it was all me dude but I've always had so many talented dudes that worked with me my 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 group of friends, like I said, the, the guys that played on um, guitars with me, like sometimes when I have people that do percussions or whatever, it's been the same people from from then till now. Who so, are, what are the two guitar players' names? Um, Rick Marcel and Charles Petaway. You know, and I've even yelled them out sometimes in songs, like you know what I'm saying. But these dudes are so talented, you know, and they old souls. And like I said, I can have a bad day sometimes, and they'll 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 just tell me where I'm off. Like, and and I love that about people when you know when when they can tell you you're tripping, and I could tell them they tripping, you know. And one of them, Charles Petaway, when I say like, man, it's like a brother to me. I can tune 808s, and you know, and they could be a little bit off, and he'll just. Like, just reach over and be like, what you doing? Like, that, that ain't it. Know what you're doing, youngster, but that ain't it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So it's, it's, it's a lot of people that went into the process of making them songs. So I just think just having a good family. Hi, my name's Andrew. Um, Hip-hop is like a really local art form. Uh, how did New Orleans influence the way you think? Like, when I listen to Illmatic, I'm instantly in New York City. Like, when you make music, do you think of New Orleans? No. The crazy thing is the world just didn't know what was going on in New Orleans. New Orleans embraced everything. Mm -hmm. Everything. Like, you know, if it was on the East Coast, West Coast, or whatever, we was playing it. We was playing B-sides that nobody was playing. Like, so I just think the world, you know, because the, the spotlight wasn't on us until, like, No Limit and Cash Money jumped off. But as a city... New Orleans always did embrace everything. You know, we, we always did listen to East Coast hip hop, West Coast hip hop, or whatever, and all of that. So I just think it's gumbo to me. It's a whole bunch of ingredients. Like, and I, I was fortunate enough to grow up on listening to all of that. Thanks. How you doing, Manny? My name is KJ. What's you up, wanna, bro? You're one of my idols, dog. Um, 
two quick questions. How y'all just recently did the uh, the Beat Summit down in uh, in Atlanta with you yeah. with you Toomp and uh, KL. I killed the ass. I, hey, <laughs> hey, they, you, you talked about that Earth Wind and Fire. They need to hear that beat that you played. They need to hear that beat, they, dude. They need to hear that Earth yeah. Wind and Fire. But um, how was it? I'll play it for. How was it just being on the stage, like being in a, in a competition with them? I mean, like, well, we real talk, dude. We just did it all in fun, like you know what I'm saying. So, and. I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't even tell y'all that. So I got this thing called Beat Summit. And what Beat Summit is, it's A-list producers beat battling. Like, you know what I'm saying? So it's, it's, you don't waste your time, you know, going, well, we got to wait to hear something that we never heard or whatever. It was DJ Toomp, and DJ Toomp got some serious songs I, I didn't even know about. You know, um, he did, like, most of T.I. hits. He did Kanye's The Good Life. He did on um, Bad Guy, Jay-Z or whatever, like, you know what I'm saying? And when he was hitting them songs, I was like, man, I got to come up with something. Like, you know, but, I mean, hey, I, I hit him with the earth, wind, and fire, like my man said. <laughs> Last but not least, what was your thought process behind this Modern Manny Fresh album? I was, dude, if you listen to that, I was uh, tripping with my, I, I'm not going to say baby mama at that time. I said baby mama. <laughs> Like, yeah, I was just, you know, it was just a day in the life of what, what, what happens with me. Like, you know what I'm saying? It wasn't a long thought, like a long process. It was just a day of, I mean, I did that album in a week. So it was everything that was going on in that week. That's what I put into it. You got some bangers on it, man. Thank you, brother. <laughs> I'm sorry for cursing, first of all. I didn't know you were saying. <laughs> Hi, my name is Aria. Hey, Aria. Hi. How did the tragedy of Katrina affect your creativity as a musician? Wow, that's a good question. That is a very good question. Um, Katrina pretty much changed the whole culture of New Orleans. Like right now, New Orleans is in a rebuild state as far as hip hop, the way it is, because a lot of people left, and even me, I'm just getting back to the city. I, I just think it took away uh, the whole essence of what was going on. Like at the time when Katrina happened, it was it was you know, you had this sound that New Orleans had, like, you know, and that just went away with Katrina. So I think it definitely changed me. And real talk, um, some things could happen in life that really show you, God got a way of showing you, like, your family, that's what's important to you. Forget everything else and whatever and all of that. Mm -hmm. So I think um, Katrina was just something that had to happen, like, because New Orleans was kind of out of control as a city and everything. So it was just one of them things that, well, it just brung a lot of us closer together and just showed me personally what's more important than everything. Your family first before all of that. Thank you. You're welcome. My name's Lucas. Um, my question, I'm a beat driven person. That's what I hear first. That's what I think of first. And it seems to me that producers don't get the credit they deserve there, you know, comes to artists not knowing who, pre who produced their own beat. And I'm wondering um, if you could get some insight to that and why you think that is. That's well, I think maybe, I think it's a generation now, but you're not going to get me to do a song and I'm not going to say my name on it. <laughs> <laughs> Especially if it's a hot song, like, because that's how I make my money, you know what I'm saying? So I think a lot of times you got to step up, you know, especially, you know, record companies that tell new age producers, like, this is sort of, um, it's a big deal. Like, let's just say you, for instance, if you got a hot song and they say, well, we're, we're going to put you with Usher, but this is the one that's going to put you on. It's not going to help you if nobody don't know you did it. You know, so I would definitely be in the studio tapping Usher on his shoulder going, hey, man, listen, I need to, I need to say something on this song, like something on the beginning. You got it for nothing. Come on, man. Let me say something. <laughs> Thank you. Can I, can I piggyback on that question? You can, you can step up. What do you think about uh, certain producers, top A-line producers who bring in up-and-coming producers through their stable, but they take half their publishing? I think that's kind of horrible. I, I, I really do. I think, you know, if you didn't do it, or there's nothing wrong with giving somebody else they shine. Like, you know, there's nothing wrong with saying, if, if you got a talented producer and he's a part of your team, he, he, he's got to start from somewhere. So, but if you see it's getting bigger and better, then, then let him grow. And like I said before, I think it's so important to the people if you're going to get the best out of somebody, give them their credit. You know, give them what they deserve. And the next time when you go to work, they're going to give you their all. 
And it's, it's nothing wrong with saying that that guy did that. Like, you know, I, I, I really believe in that. I don't, I, I don't want to do nothing that somebody else did and, you know, and they saying, you know, and I, and I say I did it. I've had record companies try to get me to do that. You know, and say, well, you know, we got this song. We just kind of want you to flip it. And I'm like, nah, that he did that. I'm not going to touch that. If you want me to do it, I'll do it over. But I'm not going to touch nothing that somebody else did. And real talk, anybody in here that's a producer, it's, it's, this is what's going on. You know, when you start asking for your money, you got to think about it right now. They got seven more kids in the room to, to replace you because... It's, it's like, okay, now they'll tell you what I was just saying. They'll say, this is a big deal. Like, okay, we're going to put you with T.I. And if you get on with T.I., like, man, it's going to start your career. And let's say you have a hit with T.I. So the next time you're asking for money, you're like, well, damn, I did what y'all asked me to do. And as soon as you start asking for money, they're going into the storage room, going to get somebody else to replace you, to move you out the way. And they're going to tell him the same story. It's just that real. So definitely make sure your paperwork right and your, your business is right. What's up, Manny? My name is Osiris. First, I want to just say, man, you are my top 10 greatest of all time producers. Thank you, bro, brother. No doubt. I want to ask, who is your top five producers of all time and who's your favorite producer today? Man, Manny. Manny Fresh. <laughs> uh, Elvis Freshly. Um, Manny Davis Jr. Uh, <laughs> me, myself, and I. Cool. It's good enough uh, for me, man. Like, there you go. <laughs> Manny, what's going on, Tez? What's up, bro? Yo, chillin', man. Question I have for you. Well, first of all, I was a little chubby in, in middle school, and... Anytime your song came on, always got the freakage. But <laughs> past, <laughs> glad anytime, I can help. Um, the question more so, because we know Cash Money, I had a very hard grassroots kind of in New Orleans. Today with the internet and just being big in your city, what would be your suggestions for that? I mean, keep pushing, man. Like, you know, it's, it's a lot of people rely on the easy way. You know, sometimes you got to go the, the, the long way, you know, and... The, the internet might not work for you. Like, you know, and somebody will be like, well, you know, I'm going to do it this way. I'm like, man, you got to just really, really keep pushing. And there's nothing wrong with the old-fashioned way. Shake some hands, kiss some babies. I mean, sell it out the trunk if you really want it. And this is a real concept. You can't cheat yourself. If, if you ordered a 1,000 CDs and it was up to you to sell them yourself and you didn't sell them, then it's, it's all on you. But if you put it in somebody else's hands, then you, 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 you mad with them or whatever, but real talk, you can't cheat yourself. Go from club to club, spot to spot, selling them out the trunk. There's nothing wrong with that. Appreciate it, man. Hi. <laughs> um, I'm, my name is Ryan. Um, I teach high school English, and I was chaperoning prime a couple weeks ago, and uh, back that thing up, came on, and everybody ran to the dance floor. Um, and so if you think these kids are like, you know, 16, 17 years old and what you said about um, looking up to God and say, I'm still relevant, really resonated because these kids are young and they still know that song, still a banger. But my question, um, kind of a two part question, is that so back in the day, rap, be rap beef, hip hop beef was really, really real. You know mm -hmm. that somebody could be coming for your life. Nowadays, it seems as if it sort of exists in the Twitter, fears, Twitter, Twitter sphere. Um, and so... I guess, what role do you feel like Rap Beef had in creating music and influencing the climate of creating rap and hip-hop back then versus what it does now, or does it have a role now? Well, um, it's so many things that can influence you. It could be a movie, it could be a rap song, it could be anything. But I just think a lot of artists don't have the guts to tell kids that it's just songs. And the real talk is, this is a different generation we growing up in. So... It's kind of sad to say, but, you know, they, they kind of a little, you know, they're a little slower than us, you know, so you have to tell them. <laughs> you got to tell them. I'm, I'm, you know, you got to say, like, hey, man, this is just entertainment. I don't want none of y'all to hurt each other. Real talk. Mm. Like, y'all have a good time, have fun, but, you know, it's like going, bro, real talk, Robert De Niro, he goes home to his family after they say cut. Mm. He's not really a gangster. Like, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> so you got to tell kids these days, and I think, I'm not saying that, I would want rappers to be role models or whatever, but sometimes it's super important that you just let these kids know, like, because you're going to have some of them that, you know, the funny thing that what you said, sometimes 
um, let's just say I'm DJing somewhere and it's a, it's a trap song or whatever, and I see kids interact the songs with their with they hands or whatever. And it's, it's crazy to me to see the things that they do. Because if the song says, shoot yourself in the head, it's kids going, <laughs> and I'm like, wow. <laughs> you know, and, and it, so that right there lets me know that it's like sometimes, like, hold on, let me turn down the music. I really want all y'all to get home safe. I, I know y'all turned up. But come on, come down a little bit. Like, you know, and I just think just as, I don't know, like as, as a family, whatever you are, black, white, or whatever, you know, you owe that to somebody just because you could save a life that night just by saying, like, dude, it's not that serious. Thank you. How you doing, man? How you doing, bro? Pretty good, pretty good. My name is Antoine, man. I had a quick question. So, like, uh, duh. But um, <laughs> the the only thing uh, um, when I hear you know you and most deaf stuff, which is you know r real dope. Um, the only other time I've really seen two rap uh, like a rapper and a producer from two totally different spectrums recently was uh, Freddie Gibbs, a rapper, and Mad Lib. They did an album recently, which I think is lovely. Yeah. Um, what who are some of like the the rappers out today that you would you know experimentally work with? And I would put a vote in for Freddie Gibbs. Man. <laughs> um, anybody that challenges me, real talk. Anybody that you know that makes me want to work. You know, it, it's, it's not really so much of me handpicking somebody. It's just somebody that brings something to the table that make you want to, you know, go harder. Where you're just like, man, that what you're doing right there makes me want to go harder. Like, so I think David Banner and No ID did something before, I, I want to say, but it, it's, it's any. Any person that you know that will come to me and has something to say and stand behind it and to me is relevant and I'm just like man like I really feel like that's you. I don't care if it's trap music or if it's just you know social whatever whatever it is that you're doing. Just know just have that essence about you that says that you you know what you're doing this with confidence. Right, I appreciate you, man. My vote is for Kevin Gates. I was just thinking that. Yeah. <laughs> I mean. Not, you know, obviously because you guys come from the same state, but I just think like where you are, just hearing that most deaf record and where he is, just like it's just like taking the taking it to the, the new yeah. level. You know. And the crazy thing, me and Kevin bump into each other. We've had long conversations and talked about hip hop and you know, it's coming. That's all I can tell y'all, it's coming. <laughs> um, I go by Mark Infinite. Uh, shout out to Ninth Wonders True School DJs. Uh, cousin B, DJ Face, T Reeves, Joe Sons here. Um, <laughs> so I had, to, I had to get that out. Um, I'm a producer and a DJ, and I want to know for the both of you, Ali Shahid and Manny Fresh. I think every producer has their run. I mean, we've seen it with the Neptunes, we've seen it with Timberland, mm -hmm. you know, uh, Polo to Don. We could go down the list. What is it like being in that process when you're just on and you're your stuff is in high demand. Like, what is, what is your thought, thought process when you're making tracks and everybody wants your stuff? Well, to me, it was never that I was on, a, you know what I'm saying? I just enjoyed doing music. You know, I never, like, that was part of the whole thing that made me leave Cash Money. I was so buried in my drum machine, I didn't even know what this was generating. You know, so I really didn't know that I was on. You know, I was just on like, hey, man, I love doing music. This is what I love doing. So, I, and on top of that, it's a state of mind to me. Like, you, you're never really out of here or whatever. Like, people will say, well, you know, I, I, I'd rather say I'm tapping out right now than to just go out like going, well, dang, man, like, why'd you do that song? Why'd you do this or whatever and all of that? Right now, I'm going to be honest with you. There's nobody that can afford Manny Fresh to me. Okay. You know, and because I think I worked hard enough to get it that way. So I'm not going to sell myself cheap. I'd rather not, you know, I'm like, hey, I could stay home and, and just do this or go back to what made me Manny Fresh, DJing. Like, and I feel like I am an original DJ. I'm not a DJ that's pretending to be a DJ. Like, you know, like you have some cats that's like, oh, I'm DJing this week. Like, I started out as a DJ and went from that to, producing, but I think, like, I, I never felt like I had this moment where I was on, and now I'm not doing it, but I get these cats now that come at me, and they like, hey, dude, 
I came see you in my Phantom, and I got all my chains on, but um, I'm trying to get the song done for a little bit of nothing. Give me a break. And I'm like, dude, you got to pay what keeps you in money. Music is the, the whole reason why you, you have all of this. You didn't short Rolls Royce, so I'm sure not going to let you short me. <laughs> <laughs> Did you ever feel like you had to reinvent yourself? I mean, no. Okay. No. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, to answer that, I love making music. And the whole being on thing, I never thought I was on. I just was on my own my own business, my own shit, to put it out there like that. Um, and I was always a weirdo. <laughs> my music was always weird, always. And it still is. And I love it that way. And I don't work with a lot of people because I'm a weirdo. And you, <laughs> you kind of got to be in weirdo mode to mess with me. Um, I'm not moved, motivated by money. And there's a lot of money I could have made, but I just like making music and I like the exploration and the conversation that comes from making music. Um, I enjoy that more than anything else. So, um, in fact, I just put up a little picture on Instagram of me getting the crazy serious blister from playing bass because I played bass for 12 hours, just like having fun, um, just tripping out on a Souls of Mischief remix album I'm doing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> this is just, this is, you know, so it's a cycle where people connect and they understand you and then they lose you because they get so many other things that draw them away, musically speaking. So it's me, I'm still doing my same weird stuff. So it's just a matter of time before they come back to that orbit around my universe. And then we click and it'll appear like I'm on, but it was never like I was on or off. I'm just here. I got one last question, because I know Go I'm ahead. not going to get this opportunity again. Um, for new up-and-coming producers, mm -hmm. I mean, you touched on it, you know, saying your name in the beginning of the tracks. Is there any other advice you would give someone that's really trying to get into production in 2014? That's my last um, question. Man, find something that that's you. Like, you know, it's, it's so easy to, I guess, um, I copy what somebody else is doing. And there's nothing wrong with getting bits and pieces from that. But definitely find something that's you. Find something that defines you, that makes you just that much different from what everybody else is doing. Because everything, like I said, when we first started this, I feel like everything to me sounds the same. Every song is almost like, man, it's like if somebody said, well, what do you want? we like, well, we want you to do a song like Drake. And you know, we're like, well, we got one Drake. We can't have a thousand of them, but unfortunately, we got a thousand of them that sound like, you know what I'm saying? The beat sound like that. Everything sound like that. So I think to to win, the, the one who goes left is considered a genius, you know, in almost anything. The, the person who's daring enough to go left to say like, well, why are y'all doing this? I'm going to do this. And I'm going to hang in there. You know, even though I got somebody telling me you're not going to be nothing, you need to, you know, because all of that come with this. You got to really have this in your heart to do it. My biggest fan is my dad. Like, you know, like t just to go back for what you said when, you know, like, you know, when you saying how did you know, you know, when you was on and you didn't know you were on. If my dad um goes to a wedding reception and he comes back and he'll say like, man, they played back that thing up. And he said, then they played like this new stuff. You know, and I'm going to say this because I don't want to really curse, but he like, man, you think they're going to play that BS 10 years from now at a wedding reception? He like, they still playing back that thing up. Right, right, right. <laughs> you know, and to have your dad high five you on it, you like, well, I'm still here. I'm, I'm like, still that's, here. that's yeah. all that count to me. Like, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> sure. Well, and your dad's a DJ, so yeah, he would Yeah, my know. dad was a street DJ. Yeah. Thank y'all. You're welcome. All right. going on, Manny, up, Franny, Ali. Um, my name is Audio with H A U H D I O. Um, and I was standing in the back of the line just kind of listening to everything that you were saying. And uh, actually, before I, before I got up here, I looked at my phone. I just got a, a 4.0, getting my master's degree. Super cool, big and, um, and I've been I've been making I've been making music all my life. I'm a music producer. I'm an artist. And I feel like, as you all were saying, the landscape of the music is just, I mean, it's all of the same song. And I've, I've made over 15 albums myself that, you know, nobody has ever heard, but it's just in my heart to do it. I'm going to yeah. make it, you know what I'm saying? But at the same time, it's like, 
you know, before, I feel like it's a work ethic thing. And I'm not sure, before you got on, you know, how much time, how much work, how much music did you actually make before the world ever heard you? You know what I'm saying? Oh, man. I'm, I'm more than sure his story is the same. I'm probably 10 years before anything, you know, before that. And I probably have songs before some of y'all was born. My first songs was in the 80s. You know, the first songs I recorded. And it was more of me being an intern somewhere at a studio sweeping and somebody like, I heard you was a DJ. Like, you want to scratch on a record? You know what I'm saying? I'm like, yeah. Next time it's like, well, we heard you could program drums, you know, and it kind of went from that. But I started DJing around when I was 13, 14 in the city. I didn't start producing probably way, way later or whatever. But I never really, really, you know, honestly, I'm not going to say this worked for everybody. I never said that I was going to make a record or nothing. I just loved what I was doing. Yeah. That I never said, like, well, you know what? My dream is one day I'm going to make a record. It's going to happen like that. I'm just like, man, you know what? I'm in love with how this sounds and how this go, and I'm just going to keep pushing. And I think a lot of people, you know, their dream is, like, I've had people that, that probably took their life savings sometimes and bought a Manny Fresh beat, and the only thing they wanted to do was just ride around the hood with it. They get two of their dudes, and they're like, dude, we got that beat. We just met it. And I'm like, well, what you going to do with it after that, you know? So it's really, you know, it's really what's, what's your thing? What, what do you like? Like, you know what I'm saying? So I, I just think that just my passion for music, because, I mean, when you have days where somebody tell you, that real talk, like these people who you was with, they beat you for millions and millions of dollars. Right. And you could pick yourself up and say, well, you know what? It's really music. Like, I know it's going to take care of me in the long run. And, you know, and what, it, what do you love? Is that what you love or do you really love, you know, the culture and what you're doing? And music has a way of taking care of you, you know, in bits and pieces or whatever. And all of us been there. You know, a lot of people going to lie and tell you that I've been broke, had money, been broke, had money. That's just what it is. That's 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 how this go. But I love what I do. Mm -hmm. I appreciate the affirmation so much. Hey, y'all. My name's uh, Alon. And uh, I had a question first for Manny and then I wanted to open it up to both Franny and Ali. Um, I just wanted to ask, where'd you get that honeycomb? Set, or where'd you find that honeycomb sample? Forgot everything. <laughs> and then to open it up, um, is Crate Digging dead, if you will? So like growing up in DC, Kent Mill Records was a spot. I know in New York there was Fat Beats. I don't know yeah. about New Orleans. But in this day and age, can we look at vinyl as beyond a novel? Not a novelty, but you know, in this digital era, if you will. So yeah. The honeycomb sample came from my dad. You know what I'm saying? He He's always been a fan of them, you know, and I just remember him playing songs screaming loud, like, you know what I'm saying, when I was growing up. And even some of the songs that I did that were samples, it was my dad's idea. Like, you know, he would always be like, man, this was a big song. Maybe you should try this one. Like, you know, see what you could do with this. So my dad always threw ideas at me that he knew that was kind of jamming songs. And some of them was B-sides, like that song. Like, you know, and he was just like, man, listen to this song. or whatever. And my dad played everything. Like, you know, he, he didn't read music at all, but he played everything. You know, so I just grew up in that house where early in the morning, you know, you hear somebody on the piano playing blues. And you're just like, dude, like you're tripping. And then he would just make up these crazy hooks himself. So I just start imitating all of that. And I just, I, everything that was kind of crazy, like what you're saying, I would say it came from my dad. Much obliged. Um, regarding the record shops and stuff, and um, it's still a bad habit I can't disconnect from. Amazon is my favorite friend right now, though, because so many shops have closed down, and uh, then you have a lot of competition from your respective DJ producer friends, and you just you want to tell them, okay, this is a spot where you can go, but then over here you think you got it, and then you see your boy walk in, you're like. <laughs> so, um, for me, Amazon has definitely just been my best friend in terms of buying vinyl, but it is something that, it, it's in waves, I guess, now, because of this, this technological, digital age we're in, where most people don't get their music from vinyl anymore. Who knows where it's going to go, though, I don't know. But I'm still, I'm still a digger. But I think we're blessed right here, because we came from the era of you had to carry crates to 
Now you got a computer, <laughs> like, you know what I'm saying? And I know none of the young DJs know what that feel like. Oh. They'll be like, dude, you, you never had 20 crates of records? <laughs> <laughs> I feel so blessed I don't have to do that. <laughs> no. I don't, do, I don't do what they do, but, I mean, YouTube is your friend. Like, I don't understand why it's so difficult for people to find things or to find rare things or to find things their friends don't know about. It's just, it's just work. Just stop doing something else and do that. Is your shirt um, the outfit Texas? The group? Nice. Yeah, Mel and Dorian are dope. You know, so. They were gonna they were gonna be my second suggestion for him to work with, actually. Really? That's funny. Okay. Yeah. yeah. They're great. Uh, I got a rep for Houston, Texas then. So. <laughs> nice. yeah. Thank you. Uh what's going on guys? Hey. Um my name is Chris Stiff and um I'm an artist and a producer. I'm from DC. And uh, also, I just want to start by saying, y'all are like legends <laughs> to me. Y'all are like living legends. I think that's tight, you know, with Manny Fresh and the whole cash money empire. And then you got like Alicia E. Muhammad, and he's like, he did Lucy Pearl. Like, he was in Lucy Pearl. People don't even know that. Like, that's like <laughs> one of my favorite R&B groups, you know what I'm saying? But yeah. So anyway, my question is in regards to the regions of hip hop and like R&B in general, and how in the digital age that kind of has all but dispersed. And you guys think that's a hindrance or something that helps with this whole mix and fusion of styles and genres? Um, I think that we as humans, just whatever this vibration we get from music, I don't think it matters where it comes from. It comes from something other, whatever. If you believe in God, create or whatever, it's another energy form that resonates with us unlike anything else. And I don't think that it's a regional based form. It can't be held. It's music is, a, you can't hold it. Like it's a wave, it goes through the air, we hear it. You know, our minds kind of like absorb it and hearts feel it and we want to dance and move and do whatever sorts of things. But in terms of it just being this regional thing, I don't, that's, a, that's, a, that's when it gets mental and it's not spiritual anymore. And that creates blocks and prevents us from communicating, and music is the best other communicator outside of speaking. And when you have people who don't speak the same language, you know, you hear some chords and everyone's just looking like. <laughs> <laughs> you know, whatever it is. So that's just my, my relationship with music. I just think you have to embrace a whole bunch of things. You have to listen to everything, absorb it. You know, the more you take in, the, the, I guess the better it'll make you for anything that you do in life. The more, you know, um, the crazy thing when we was on tour, like with Cash Money, if anything else came on the TV, it, it would seem like I was the only person that knew the lyrics to it. If it was a Public Enemy song, I'm the only one that's singing it. Everybody else is just like, what the, man, what is that? You know what I'm saying? But I'm... I, I'm glad that I did because it just taught me so many things. Like because I'm like, hey, I, I I did albums, so I was like, I can't just listen to one particular sound and, and stick to one thing. If you if that's where you at, then everything that you do gonna sound just like that. Like you know, and I just think, like he said, you can't hold music at all. Just embrace it, take it in. Sometimes you, I, I find myself listening to country music. And I'm just like, man, like the lyrics is crazy on a lot of these songs. I'm like, they really talking some cool stuff. Like, you know what I'm saying? But it's it's just that you have to embrace everything. It's going to make you a better person overall. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. I think one of the one of the best uh hip hop songs ever made was um Looking for the Perfect Beat um by Africa Bambada and Sol uh Soul Sonic Force and they were listening to Kraftwerk. You know, so that's to me, that's my blueprint for hip hop and just life and music in general. It's just we all feed one another, but we just have to be open enough to 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 hear it and to appreciate it and to maybe dislike it in the same space, but to be able to uh, accept each other's feelings about it. And I guess, you know, just having you all here is, is uh, sort of an example of that. You know, so thank you for coming here and, and being a part of our first live <laughs> microphone check. 
Um, yeah. with, with, with Manny Fresh, who's a legend, and you carry Louisiana, you know, you carry America, you know, you carry hip hop in a way that I don't think is wholly accepted and embraced and you underrated, you're not talked about enough in a lot of these conversations. You are in terms of like producers and stuff like that, but just in, in terms of the conversation of, of, of producers and, and a pioneer in hip hop, you are that person. And um, may you forever be in search of the quintessential Manny Fresh <laughs> song, and may you never find it, but still be in that loop of finding yeah. it. Uh, so that you could continue to bless us, man. Thank you thank so you, much. Thank you, thank you. Thank y'all. I know you could be anywhere else in the world, but y'all here, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you, guys. Please, please spread the word about NPR. Music, microphone check, you can tell your friends to tell a friend to tell a friend we changing things here. You know? <laughs> yeah. you know?